let me just briefly introduce the guest speaker before the break. Uh, he is, let's say, one of the pioneers of a field which is called soft robotics. And he has also a research center in Boston where they explore all aspects of what they call soft material robotics. And he will give a talk about living machines, soft animals, soft robotics, and biohybrids. So uh, I guess he will introduce us to this idea of what biohybrids actually are. So I suggest, so uh, Barry, I'm very happy that you're with us. I should also mention that I think in Boston, it's like around 5.30 a.m., right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so welcome to the early riser in, uh, in Boston. So I think we all very much appreciate the fact that you came to us at such an early time. Okay, but now, uh, you know, I really have the pleasure to, uh, to uh, pass the floor to Barry Trimmer and thank him again for coming so early. I had also the privilege of visiting his, his uh, institute just recently, and I have to say it's absolutely fascinating work, and he will give us uh, at least a, a flavor of the research that they're doing in Boston. The floor is yours, Barry. We are very much looking forward to your uh, presentation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Pfeiffer, for inviting me, and thank all of you around the world for uh, logging into this video conference and uh, and listening to me. Um, it's it is early in the morning here, but I understand it's the middle of the day for a lot of you there. So uh, so thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is bring a little bit of biology directly into this to talk about how we can use. Uh, what we find out about biology to try and inform the way we build devices. And in particular, this, uh, this whole concept of embodiment and how do you uh, build the intelligence into a system by exploiting the body. And clearly, animals do this. Um, there's no such thing as a brain without a body. There's no such thing as a body without a brain. They work as a concerted system and always have done. And I think that that principle is a really, really important one that we need to try and exploit as much as possible. And I think when we try to build devices that are not as traditional, in other words, we try to incorporate new types of materials and new capabilities, we're really going to have to understand how animals uh, use their body in order to simplify tasks, and in order to figure out how the computation occurs distributed between the body and the brain. So the key element here is that uh, our traditional robots are built from hard materials. And um, yet bodies, as you can see in this slide here, and I hope it's not uh, around lunchtime for some of you to see parts of the body. Um, Bodies are not built entirely from hard materials, and in fact, even animals like ourselves, which have a stiff skeleton, or insects like cockroaches, which have a stiff exoskeleton, the majority of the body is still composed of soft, floppy materials. And yet you rarely see this sort of material in modern machines. We use soft materials sometimes to soak up energy, so as uh, shock absorbers, or to store energy, but we very rarely build the machine directly out of these materials. And in general, as an engineering principle, soft materials are thought of as uh, a problem to solve uh, rather than something that we can use in a, in a constructive way. And I want to make a big distinction between soft and merely flexible, because there are many, many flexible robots out there, robots that are multi-jointed but made of hard materials. But I think that soft is a slightly different property. And soft is a relative term. It, it is uh, affected by the size range that you're working in. So we have to define what soft means. And it really depends on the mass and the, the size and the speed of the device or the animal. Um, it's not necessarily the opposite of hard or stiff, because the bulk properties of soft materials aren't typically hard or stiff, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. 
And flexible materials don't necessarily have to be soft. You can see this example that I, I show here uh, where we have... <clears throat> sorry, I get my pointer back. Uh, we have a, a flexible... A flexible ruler, and it can be bent and turned, but it actually keeps its perimeter and its general shape. It doesn't actually deform uh, in any major way. However, truly soft materials, and shown here is some, some dough, uh, truly soft materials are highly deformable under the normal forces that are used. So... We have to start asking, before we even delve into the idea of building devices that are soft, is why would we do that? What's the point? Because to be quite frank, anything that we build from a soft material is going to be slower, it's going to be relatively inefficient, it's not going to be as powerful. Uh, soft materials tend to dissipate energy in ways that isn't always useful. So why would we use soft materials? Well, there's a little bit of a list here. Soft robots are going to be extremely robust to sudden impact and large forces. And I think a great example of this is when uh, the original Mars lander was put down, they used large inflatable bags that cushioned its, its, uh, its descent onto the surface of the planet. And obviously you can drop a soft robot from high altitude and it just bounces. So they absorb energy. Another big advantage that we don't think of very often in terms of robots is the ability to change shape and size. And I've said here that they can access denied space. Uh, that's a military term for being able to get somewhere that they're not really allowed to go. Uh, so let's say you need a robot to climb in a very, very cluttered environment. Uh, let's say a nuclear disaster. We're trying to look in the wiring harness. We can't send people in there. Extremely confined space. It would be wonderful to have a robot that was soft and deformable but could get in there. Another big advantage of building soft into robots is that they will interface much, much more easily and better and safely with humans. Uh, the recent Robonaut that was put into the space station, uh, it took a long time, many, many years to get that approved for use in the space station, mainly for safety reasons. Uh, people were worried about a hard, powerful robot being able to injure somebody. An injury in space is a big problem. So soft robots are much, much more uh, compatible with our natural and human-made environments. And to follow up on that also, soft materials have a better potential for interfacing directly with humans, building uh, prosthetics, uh, working in the medical realm, uh, doing diagnosis, uh, looking inside the body. And they can also be extremely light, low-density machines. Um, and finally, I think something that is not always emphasized, but by building something out of soft materials, you access a whole range of chemistry that you can then use to build the robots. And you can, in fact, make these robots biodegradable, biocompatible. So these are a whole host of, of qualities that aren't traditionally seen in robots, but are very much part and parcel of the way animals work. So flexible and soft robots, or compliance, which is the uh, ability to actually bend and absorb uh, mechanical energy uh, has been used in a variety of robots and here I've just sort of laid out the uh, the spectrum of machines that are being researched upon and you can go all the way from relatively stiff robots so uh, the cockroach robots and things like ASIMO and uh, robots like that, they have some compliance built in in order to be able to absorb energy and, and not get sudden impacts, but overall they're considered to be relatively stiff. Um, flexible robots tend to be modular, so a series of connected joints. They're fantastic, they work really, really well, but you immediately add the problem of complexity and possible failure by adding many joints. And the area of robots that I'm interested in working in is this flexible continuum and soft robots uh, where you actually have intrinsic structure that is self-supported, so they're soft that they support themselves, but are nonetheless highly deformable. And I can actually show this is a body shell of a robot, and I think you can see that this...
is extremely deformable. This is the type of material that we want to be able to use. Um, people are also exploiting the far end of the spectrum, which is gels, and this is mainly looking at what type of actuators might be made. So I'm going to predominantly talk about the, the soft elastic area of uh, performance. And all of our research is guided by the basic ideas that you've been hearing about in this lecture course, that the interaction of the nervous system or the central command system, which is shown over here, together with the body, the chassis, the actuators, and the sensor system, together give you performance. That in fact, these are so highly integrated that even separating them into these boxes is not necessarily the way the, uh, the system works. We have to think a lot more about the arrows linking these boxes. So it's the coordination of these things that's very important. Now, I don't have enough time to cover each of these areas in detail. I want to go through instead and talk a little bit about the central command systems and the body and how those two things interact and do so with an example of an animal, which is, in fact, a caterpillar that we work on, a soft animal, and the robots that we're trying to develop based on that animal. So we transition from thinking about robots to thinking about animals. Uh, and there, the microprocessor, if you will, is the central nervous system. And the effectors are the body and the muscles. And we must also remember that the interaction also occurs with the environment. This is an absolutely crucial element. Uh, the output of the nervous system and the body is impacted by whatever context the animal or the robot finds itself in. So it's very important to think about the way the interactions occur with the environment. And I think you'll see in the example, particularly with the animal, we've established that in fact for a caterpillar, the environment is its skeleton. And I think that's a, a kind of an interesting twist on thinking about soft animals. So let's first look at the body and the muscles of the systems that we want to look at. So the biology, my slides, uh, there's a slight delay, so I'm going to pause and make sure the slides come up. Okay, so the biology uh, shown over here, this is the, the animal that we work on. This is the Manduca sexta caterpillar. It's a large caterpillar of a large moth, a night-flying lepidopteran, and it's our model system. We are building uh, robots that vaguely resemble that, but we've abstracted the basic principles of how the caterpillar works in order to test our theories about the control of a soft structure. So what I'd like to do is show you an example of, uh, of the caterpillar moving around. So if we could see the first movie, Manduka Crawl, please, Nathan. So I hope that you can see this. Uh, this is a close-up of the caterpillar moving. It climbs extremely effectively. And here's an illustration of how the caterpillar can move in a complex, highly structured environment, very unpredictable environment. Uh, I used to joke that this is actually our robot that we developed for navigating wiring systems, but it really is just a caterpillar trying to find its way around. But you can see the complexity of its movements uh, and his ability to change his body form. And the animal will also burrow. As you can see here, it's uh, digging its way into a, into a burrow to pupate. And this is not a natural situation, but I just wanted to point out it will also crawl perfectly well underwater. Uh, and in fact, its crawling is indistinguishable underwater from in the air. Okay. So... That's the animal, and uh, just because we're in real time on my video, I can actually show you that we do have one here, just to give you a sense of the scale. This is a living caterpillar. Uh, it's not moving around very much right now because it's too early in the morning for it, but you can see it at roughly the size of that animal. Now, I need to explain a little bit about some of the structure of the animal, and it's a bit of biology, but I think you'll see its relevance to, to, uh, to the subject of the, of the lecture series. Here is the caterpillar, we'll call it Manduka, so uh, it's 
uh, about five, two to five grams, can grow a little bigger. When they hatch, I think you can probably see this little guy here riding on its back. That is a fresh hatchling, and the difference in age between these two stages is three weeks. It grows 10,000 times in mass in three weeks, which is an amazing change. And it continues to use the same control system, the same muscles, the same uh, locomotion, even at those two different size scales. Now imagine trying to scale a robot with a gasoline-powered engine and have it work identically even over a scale, size scale of 10,000 fold. And I think you can imagine the physics of that is quite a problem. These animals have no problem dealing with that. Now what I'm going to do is, is show you a little bit of anatomy because we want to talk about how this animal gets around, what its actuators are. So each part of the animal is a, is a body segment. They're continuous inside the animal, but they're, they're repeated all the way along. So each body segment has more or less the same sets of muscles inside. And uh, I've outlined a, a body segment. I hope that that's visible. And what we're going to do uh, is expand that and show you a model of, of most of the muscles. This dark patch here that I'm highlighting, that dark patch is a breathing tube. And in the model diagram, you'll see it corresponds to this area. So there'll be, it'll be a little delay, so I'm going to make sure that everyone can see that as it comes up. So the muscles in this animal are quite complicated. It has about 2,000 muscles. And uh, each body segment contains about, about 100 or so major muscles. I don't know if my slides are coming up. Are they actually appearing? Can people see them? Okay, good. Um, so this is an illustration of one body segment showing uh, some of the major muscles, not all of them. And the wonderful thing about this animal is that the muscles are always the same. They're controlled by exactly the same nerve cells. And remarkably enough, each muscle is controlled generally by just one nerve cell. And that's really, really important because it allows us to monitor the electrical activity of the neurons that control those muscles. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of these muscles. It's actually this muscle here, VIL, which is a, a large ventral muscle, the one that's in blue, light blue. The muscle can be taken out of the animal and we can look at the muscle and try and treat it as a material and say, what kind of material properties does this muscle have? An important thing to take away is that muscle, as is any tissue, is a multi-state material. So it has lots of interesting properties, and it varies between those properties depending on what happens to it. On the left of this slide, you can see that the muscle is being stretched out to different lengths. So the strain is on the x-axis. And we're measuring the force on the y-axis that is required to stretch it out and then to release it. So if you follow the black uh, loop here um, on the first slide where it says 1 hertz. So this was being stretched and released at once per second. And you can see that just the muscle sitting there, just not being stimulated, it stretches out. It's fairly soft. And then when you return it to its original length, it actually doesn't follow the exact same line. So it's not a perfect elastic. If it was a perfect elastic, it would be a straight line back and forth. It would return all the energy that it absorbed, sorry, that it was put in. Uh, this muscle, of course, has what we call resilience. It's tending to lose energy. It is actually dissipating work. The area and the curve here is work dissipated. If you stimulate that muscle so it's now contracting, or would try to contract, it's developing force actively, now do the same test and you find here the active muscle, the red line, follows a loop that is much stiffer. The slope is much higher and it's dissipating a whole lot of energy. So we don't normally think of muscles as energy dissipators. We think of them as actuators doing work. Uh, but under these, these conditions, obviously, the muscle is simply dissipating work. It's important to note that the amount of energy and the format of that dissipation varies depending on the speed with which 
the muscle is being cycled. So as we increase the cycle rate to 2 hertz all the way up to 16 hertz, you can see that the muscle's stiffness and its properties is changing. This is a property called viscoelasticity. It is the change in the uh, st apparent stiffness and the behavior of the material as a function of time and forces that are being applied. So it's a complex material just even when we're not doing anything with it particularly interesting, we're just simply moving it back and forth and, and looking at the forces. Another aspect on the right-hand side, this so-called Mullins effect, is that muscle has history dependence. So here we see successive cycles of stretching a muscle out that is then being returned back to its original length and is being done repeatedly. And you can see that the very first cycle is different from the others, but then each one is slightly different from the one before it. So muscle gradually gets softer the more you stretch it, the more often you stretch it. And if you then just leave it, let it rest, it will return back to its original properties. And this is uh, a property, the Mullins effect is typically seen in, in, uh, in rubber materials that have got a lot of particulate uh, matter in there, so carbon powder inside rubber would do exactly the same, same thing. So we have to bear in mind that muscle is a complex material. Now that complexity from an engineering point of view would be treated as a problem. Of course, the way we look at it is that through evolutionary processes, it's that very complexity of the material which gives you an opportunity to offload the computation to the tissue. The tissue is doing something materially interesting. So we can actually, instead of looking at muscle in those very uh, passive conditions where we're just cycling it, is to instead take muscle and look at the way it performs inside the animal. When we uh, look at the animal in, uh, in, in our system here at Tufts, we uh, record the different lengths of the muscle. So we put markers on both ends of the muscle, and as the animal moves around, we can see the muscle changing length. So we can record that change of length, and as I'm going to show you shortly, we can also record the electrical activity causing that change. So that means that we can now take the muscle out and move it through cycles of strain as if it was in a crawling caterpillar. And if we could have the next movie, uh, you'll see an example of a muscle which is being stimulated by a nerve, and you can see it contract there and pull back again. So it's, it's being gently stretched, so there is a, a bias spring helping to pull it out again, because muscles do not actively extend. But every time we sent action potentials into that muscle, it would cause it to contract. So if we take that uh, muscle, and as you can see here on the right-hand side of this slide, we have subjected the muscle to strain, and I'm highlighting the strain, which is actually a simplified version of the way in which the muscle is moved during crawling in the caterpillar. We have then measured the forces, which is the top line, all of this, and stimulated the muscle during the period that it would normally be stimulated when the animal is crawling. We then have taken that and thrown away time and simply plotted the stress, so the force per cross-sectional area of the muscle, against the fractional length change of that muscle. So once again, a so-called work loop. And you can see it's much, much more interesting than the work loops we had before, which were purely dissipating work. In fact, you can see that for most of the cycle, this clockwise direction is actually dissipating work. So this muscle is acting to form as a brake or a shock absorber. But when it's very short, it's actually a counterclockwise loop. So it's doing work. It's active positive work. So muscle can change its function even within a single cycle of stimulation. And I think that's a really interesting lesson about how we need to think about actuators. So how do we use that? Well, obviously one big problem of building robots that are soft is what do we use for an actuator? And there isn't a good answer right now. Uh, electroactive polymers are one possibility. 
Uh, we use these things, which are shape memory alloy coils. Um, you can see one extended here. When they are uh, heated by resistive heating, passing a current through them, there is a change in the crystalline structure of the metal, which causes it to shrink a little bit. And overall, the wire shrinks about 3%, but if you've got it coiled, you can obviously convert that 3% to a very large strain. So we can get strains that are equivalent to caterpillar muscle. And we're using that in our little uh, robotic platforms, these uh, soft inchworm-like robots. We place those coils inside the robot and use them as if they are muscles. And in order to uh, start to design the way we want to control this, we obviously need to know the properties of the shape memory alloy coils. And we do that by testing them over on the right you can see our test rig. We have a simple um, um, uniaxial uh, material testing system. The shape memory alloy sample is at one end with a load cell that can record the, the forces. It's in a series with an elastic cord so that it's constantly pulling against a force. We can change what that force is. And over on the right, you can see that we stimulate this shape memory alloy coil with uh, frequency changing pulses. So we use pulses of current uh, driven by voltage and those pulses of current can be applied at different frequencies and when we do that over on the right side of this slide we can see these increases in force that are generated uh, that very very much resemble the way muscle works. So as you increase the frequency gradually the those uh, little pulses fuse together to create an increased tension. So when I contract my, my flexor muscles, as I increase the frequency of stimulation, I get a higher and higher force, and it will cause stronger and stronger contraction. And all of those pulses fuse together. And shape memory alloy performs very, very similarly. Uh, most people don't use it in their robots because it's relatively slow, but uh, our robots are intrinsically slow anyway. So is the Caterpillar, so it's actually a good model for us. And here we can see that the uh, shape memory alloy coils, we actually use commercially made ones now rather than the one that uh, is shown on this slide, which is one that we've made. The commercial ones are extremely reliable. Uh, they're really wonderfully made, and we can't manufacture these in our facilities, so we, we, we simply purchase these. Uh, but when we apply a, a, a voltage to these um, coils, they get an increase in force, they shorten in length, we can plot work loops. And as you can see, this particular work loop is entirely counterclockwise. It is generating work, so it is actually doing positive work. Okay, so now I've described a little bit about the, uh, the actuators, the body, and how we can go from muscle to uh, a synthetic form that we might use in a robot. Now we need to think a little bit about, um, about what causes the, how we control uh, these movements. And so in the animal, we have to think about the nervous system and how the nervous system affects the actuators. Uh, I already showed a diagram of the, uh, the muscle structure in a single body segment. And... Here we can see, a, again, a simplified cross-section through one of those body segments. So it's as if we've taken the caterpillar and cut it right through from top to bottom, and we're looking down inside the cavity of the caterpillar. And the muscles are arranged in layers uh, towards the back, the dorsal surface, and the ventral surface. We can name the muscles. We know what they are. Um, in the figure below, you can see them as if they've been flattened out. And we have developed a technology, these multi-electrode arrays, that allow us to implant uh, sensors underneath the muscles inside a living caterpillar. And it can move around, as shown in the diagram in the lower right, can move around with these electrode arrays implanted. And we can record the electrical activity of the muscles. Now, this is very important because muscles are not intrinsically, these muscles are not intrinsically electrically active. They are only electrically active when the nerve tells them to do something. So by recording the electrical activity, we actually can detect what the nervous system is telling the body. And we can detect it not just 
uh, in some arbitrary fashion, but we can actually measure the spike frequencies, the number of action potentials that are stimulating the muscle at any moment during any behavior. So we can effectively record the neural coding that is controlling the motion. And this slide, the next slide is some results of that, and it's a little bit busy. There's a lot of data on here, and I don't want to, to go into it in too much detail, but I want to give you a sense of what we can do with this. Um, in part A, on the top right, we see the raw recordings of the electrical activity of the muscles in, of two different muscles. So uh, one called A3, VIL, and A6. These are in two different body segments. And we can see alongside that the velocity of the leg in that body segment. So we can record the swing and the stance phases of, this, of, the, of the animal's movement. And we can either convert these electrical impulses into spike frequencies or, as we've done here, just simply integrate all the activity and get a general sense of, of, the, of the electrical activity, which has been done in the lower graph. And that's being compiled for multiple uh, crawls, so the animal's crawling along, we've just overlaid all of that electrical activity, and we've aligned them to the motion, so this, this large peak here is the motion of the leg in that body segment. And then we can define the, uh, the duration of the electrical activity in those two muscles by measuring the, the width of that electrical activity, and that's been plotted down below in these, these horizontal bar charts to illustrate the timing of the electrical activity to these two muscles and how it, it uh, corresponds, its phase relationship to the movement. So this really gives you a sense of how we can actually measure the electrical timing, all the patterns that go into making the animal move. And we can do this for many muscles. So I show here an example of some other muscles that we've done this for too. So this is really very, very powerful because it allows us to, to collect all the information we need. We, we know the body's movements, we know the electrical activity. If we combine that with one other piece of data, which is the forces that the animal imposes on its surroundings, and this is all collected with a custom-made force sensing array, uh, we find that something very, very interesting. Much to our surprise, uh, the animal doesn't use its legs just to push itself around, but we find from the ground reaction forces that the back end of the animal is actually always dragging. It is resisting movement forward. And this is so counterintuitive that when we first saw it, we thought something was wrong with our sensors, that maybe we coupled them up the wrong way. But in fact, it's absolutely the way the animal gets around. It keeps its back end attached to the substrate even while the front end is moving forward and pulls itself into tension. Then it lets go with the back end and pulls itself forward through elastic recoil and muscle activity. So by recording neural activity, kinematics, and ground reaction forces, we've been able to come up with this, this new idea about the way a soft animal might navigate the world it's so soft, it doesn't actually withstand compressive forces. So it applies the compressive forces to the substrate. The substrate, which is normally crawling on leaves and branches, has to be stiffer than the animal. And it transfers force, compressive forces, through the substrate in order to move forwards. This is an environmental skeleton, is what we call this. And we can see an example there where we put all this together. Uh, again, I won't go over it in too much detail. If you're interested, this has all been published and is available. Um, but we have been able to illustrate how the, uh, the sequence of firing of muscles and neurons that control those muscles, shown in pink, is a wave of overlapping activity in muscles it's fairly crude. It doesn't have to be very accurate. All the animal needs to do is time very carefully when it lets go of the substrate so that it can maintain this tension uh, in its body that it can then release each time in order to move forwards. So I think this is an important lesson. It tells us that the, the structure of the body is extremely important and that the neural control system is designed exactly, of course, designed, it's evolved, to match 
the, the body properties. And this allows the caterpillar to stay soft. It doesn't have to pressurize excessively. Uh, it actually doesn't use pressure to control its motions, and it can conform to its substrate. So, just keeping my eye on the time here. Okay, so how do we translate some of these ideas into, into robots? What we've done is not try to replicate a complete caterpillar because there are many, many parts of an animal that have nothing to do with the, the parts that we're interested in. Uh, the animal has to eat. It has to be able to navigate uh, and maybe it's even socially interacting. Uh, although these animals don't mate, its uh, adult stage does. Clearly animals are doing a lot of things that have nothing to do with controlling locomotion. So we don't want to just copy everything inside the caterpillar. We want to abstract the important things to make our robot. And the level at which one abstracts is always a, a tricky issue because you're throwing away important information. But what we've done is convert our, our caterpillar with its 10 major contact points and convert it into three contact points in a simple uh, silicone elastomer body. And those three contact points are moved around and the deformation of the body controlled by just a pair of actuators one at the front and one at the back. So those are our artificial muscles. And you can see this, this robot here. It's, uh, this one's called GoQbot. Uh, this one is tethered. We actually do have some battery-powered ones that are, are uh, able to move around um, off a tether and controlled by radio control. But uh, mostly we use them tethered because the shape memory alloy requires a lot of current and is not very efficient. And it's possible to construct these and make them move in relatively interesting ways that actually do resemble the way caterpillars get around. Caterpillars have a variety of gates that they can engage in, and we can replicate many of those gates shown in this diagram by carefully organizing the timing of the actuation, the, the front actuator, the back actuator, the anterior and posterior, if we vary the duration and the phase relationship of those two actuators, and that's shown, for example, over at the top here, then we get a particular sort of motion. Here we call it anterior inching. Um, if we instead extend the duration of those and alter the order a little bit, then we can have this sort of so-called loose crawling. And I just want to now show you uh, the, the next video, uh, which is an example of one of these inchworms moving through a small aperture. Now, they certainly don't look as impressive as some of the robots that you might see coming out of uh, Boston Dynamics, but uh, this was quite an accomplishment for us. It's a radio-controlled inchworm robot using different gates. And by the way, it's pulling behind itself a little power pack, a little battery power, that's uh, ancillary power that it can use. Now, obviously that look slow and you might say well are all, all robots that we make that are soft going to be slow crawling worms and what use is that? Well we want to point out that there are some advantages to being soft that allow you to change the way you move in the world. You can morph, you can change shape. When you change shape you now have ways of moving that were not available before and the example that I want to give is that by increasing the power to the shape memory alloys in very, very, very short pulses, overlapping both the anterior and the posterior drive, so both of those actuators move simultaneously, you can generate extremely fast ballistic rolling. And we're going to look at the next video. It might not be possible to see it because it's so fast, but let's move to video for the fast roll and see if we actually see the, the robot move. Whoa, I'd actually pause then. <laughs> that was in real time. Can we see it again, Nathan? Thank you. It didn't follow through its complete cycle, but this, this robot rolls really, really quickly. And if we look at the next movie, um, you can see it in slow motion. It's been slowed down, uh, I believe, tenfold. Let's have a look at the next one. There we go. That's the role. So you can see that it generates a very, very rapid motion. Thank you, that's good. So 
it seems very artificial that we're creating a motion that has nothing to do with animals. It turns out that caterpillars do exactly that. So there are a whole variety of species that when they're being bothered by a predator, curl up and roll and move really, really quickly. So it actually is very, very biomimetic, uh, and uh, I think it illustrates the power of being able to change morphology. And uh, the last part on the robots, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about control. The robot uh, that we just saw, we were using what I might call intuitive controls. We sat down and tried to figure out how to make it move around in the world. And that really isn't a very systematic approach. It doesn't tell you very much about what rules to use for building soft robots. Uh, what we'd ideally like to do is search all of the possible control space and find good solutions without necessarily understanding how it's working. And as an illustration of that, we built a different type of robot. Uh, this one's a pneumatic piston-controlled robot, so it actually has some hard parts in it. These pistons here are um, controlled by air. The body itself is a silicon elastomer. It's soft. And we, we created this in order to illustrate some of the control principles that we're interested in. This is much easier to model than the inchworm that I just showed you, surprisingly enough. Uh, and we can make an FEM model, and we can also uh, define the actuators. So I show you here that the green is a pair of actuators at the back end, and the red are the actuators towards the front. And you can imagine that the easy way to make this thing move would be, as I've shown in this top figure on the, on the right side, that you would actuate the the back end of the robot, then the middle, and then the front in sequence, and you'd expect it to start moving forwards by deformation. Well, we tried that, and it doesn't go anywhere. This robot simply sits there and wiggles back and forth, back and forth, and it really doesn't move. And we were very surprised that we couldn't make it move. And we tried all sorts of things, and it just seemed to be random. So then we actually used our simulations of this robot to create uh, a, a simulation that could be tracked in, in the computer and that we could do genetic algorithm selection of motor programs that might make it move forwards. And when we did that process, we ended up with the patterns that you see in the other three panels here. So third place was the third fastest, second place, second fastest, first place was the fastest one that we actually made. And I defy you to actually explain what those patterns are doing because they don't look intuitive. They don't look as if there's something that would make this move forwards, but in fact, they really do. And if we could see the movie Six, um, you should be able to see that this evolved motor program, although not efficient, creates locomotion forward. I hope that we've got that. That's it. Now, doesn't look very impressive, but it really is moving forwards. Uh, you can see relative to the scale. And I think it's important to note that this is exploiting something that we don't understand. Differential friction, dynamics, uh, something is happening to make that move forward in a non-intuitive way. And I think it helps to illustrate the power of using a, a evolutionary approach or some sort of um, optimization process that will involve many, many generations to create a control system that exploits the behavior of the body uh, and that won't necessarily be an intuitive control. Now, we're coming towards the end of the talk, so I'd like to just uh, describe some of the new work that we're doing that leads on from these robots. Uh, if you're interested, by the way, we have a lot more work on those robots uh, that we can talk about, a lot more on the animals, but um, let's move on to the next stage of what we think uh, would be a, a really interesting avenue of research, which is to start using biological materials and underlying mechanisms of biology in creating our devices. When we were trying to build our artificial muscles by using shape memory alloys, we, we were getting very frustrated, and we kept thinking, well, why are we doing this when we already have a soft actuator that works very well, and we call it muscle? And muscle itself is an extremely good uh, actuator, good material. And so we thought, well, let's extend beyond that. Why don't we actually exploit all the basic principles that animals use in order to make our devices? 
When you think about it, a fertilized egg has all of the information to self-assemble an entire organism like a whale. And inside that whale is a muscle as big as a Volkswagen. We call it a heart. It's an enormous thing. And it's assembled from the information that was available in that initial fertilized egg. So biological systems self-assemble from the nano level, the molecular level, all the way to the macroscopic level. We don't necessarily have to understand all of the processes, but we can exploit them. So we can start to use those basic underlying uh, bits of information embedded in tissues that allow them to form structures. So this is our biosynthetic robot initiative. And the basic underlying idea is that we create a, a scaffold in some sort of bioreactor. And that scaffold is, uh, is the underlying um, substrate on which the cells can grow. And if we apply the correct growth factors and adhesion factors and everything that cells like to stick to, we can direct cells to grow in the right place at the right time and develop their structure. And once the robot's grown, we, the idea would be we, we take it out of its broth, we clip in a little microcontroller, and away it walks. And so this concept of a, a biosynthetic robot, one that is made predominantly from living cells that are the actuators, uh, would also include an important part, which is the fuel system. Um, I like to say that you know, you're all sitting in uh, lecture halls and rooms around the world, and uh, you feel perfectly safe with other people in there. But if you converted all those people to gasoline-powered engines that were sitting running, you would be a little bit nervous about being poisoned or some other danger. Uh, those gasoline-powered engines are burning hydrocarbons, uh, and so are all the people in the room. We're all burning hydrocarbons, glucose, fats predominantly, and it's perfectly safe. So if we can make our biohybrid robots, our biocomponent robots, they can be fueled with perfectly safe lipids, fat, and sugars. So that's the, the concept. And we have been working on this for several years and made some progress. It's a, it's a, a very, very difficult uh, thing to actually implement to get cells to grow the way you want them. Uh, but the big trick that we think is important in this is to use the right cells. So we're using insect cells, which are very, very tough, very tolerant of environmental conditions. We extract the cells, we put them into culture conditions, and these will grow, so they start off just as pre-myocytes, they're not muscles, but they grow into muscles. And they grow into muscles that are active and able to move, and they form, naturally form networks of, of muscle cells that interconnect with one another. And you can see an example of those uh, in this slide, the network of muscles, and they, they will can continue to contract for at least three months without doing anything else to them. We don't have to change the media or anything. Very, very different from vertebrate cells that under these conditions will be dead in a few hours. And I think uh, if we can have the next movie, we can actually see an example of these networks of muscles moving. So here we have uh, living cells growing in a dish, uh, perfectly happy and obviously very alive. Now, those networks are not particularly useful as actuators, so we need to structure the muscles, and that's the big challenge, making the muscles grow where we want them to grow and in the way we want them to grow. Uh, but we've been able to successfully uh, train the muscles, if you will, by appropriate environmental conditions and make them grow into, into shapes like the one you see here, where we have a, a, a silk thread and the muscle is attached to the silk thread as a, as a, as a long actuator. We can grow them in different formats, as rings, for example. So if you wanted to make a pump, that would be a good way to do it. And these muscles are actually functional as well. So if we can see the, uh, the, the last movie here, um, movie eight. And the muscles are uh, spontaneously contracting and able to generate forces. There we go. You see that force, the muscle contracting. So this is uh, actually quite a large muscle. It's, uh, it's probably about uh, 500 microns across. 
uh, we can get them up to about two or three millimeters across, which is still small. We'll be making small robots, but it is much larger than, than most uh, cell cultured muscles. So that's, we think, part of the future. I don't think it's going to be what all robots are, but uh, I certainly think that incorporating not only biological principles and things that we've learned from the animals, but also using uh, the tissues and the materials of the animals themselves, we'll be able to create entirely new sorts of devices. And the part that underlies all of this is that it's only worth trying to build these robots and to develop soft robots if we understand how to control them, how to move them around. And that is the key element. I think that uh, we can certainly design anything and build anything. Humans are very, very good at that. But uh, if we don't understand how to make them do what we want, then uh, there's no point to it. So I think that the control aspect, the, set, the embodiment principles, uh, and finding ways to make the body part of the calculation of the control is very important. And uh, as a last note, here are some of the people involved in building the robots, but I'd also like to do an advertisement, and sorry about this, Ralph, but I, uh, I, I feel it's important that uh, we talk about a new program just quickly. Um, we have recently been awarded a, a grant from the National Science Foundation for interdisciplinary graduate education and research training in soft material robotics. This is an interdisciplinary PhD program in soft material robotics, and uh, it's a five-year program. We're going to have uh, stipends and fellowships for 21 PhDs, uh, and it's the first time, I believe, in the world that uh, such a PhD program has been put in place. And we're going to try and develop new types of mobile machines, not just the inchworms that you've seen. Uh, lots and lots of people are involved, engineers, uh, computer scientists, biologists, biomedical engineers. And we are arranging the PhDs in, in research teams with uh, undergraduates and other graduates and uh, multiple advisors and trying to approach complex problems from a multidisciplinary point of view. And if people are interested in that program, they can certainly look at the contacts that are on the screen here. And I'll stop there and take any questions if we have time. Thank you. Okay, Barry, thank you. Thank you very much for an absolutely fascinating lecture. And I think the advertisement at the end is very appropriate for this audience because I imagine that at least some of the students that are attending this lecture series will be very, very interested in these uh, opportunities in the future. So, Excellent. Right. Okay, so I think we're, of course, heavily over time, but it doesn't matter. I think we should still take a few questions. We should grasp the opportunity, seize the opportunity, and see if you have any questions to Barry. I think this is, uh, this is uh, the time to ask your questions. I mean, these, you know, bio hybrids, so you use uh, biological materials, you fuse them with uh, technology, you know, with chips and stuff. I think that's uh, fascinating, but also maybe scary kind of technology. So do we have uh, comments or questions from the global uh, lecture hall? If there are questions, please say which site you are from, then I can put you on the screen. Question. Yeah, okay, from here, from Salford. Maybe Hi, thank you very much. You have to move yes. over here. So, yes. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your uh, very, very interesting and inspiring lecture. I wanted just to, uh, I really like that, uh, you know, the research that you are doing in growing robots. Uh, could you see or foresee potential application in, in this and where? Exactly. I guess that you are doing research in that, which is really interesting. I could see the material and all this, but where, uh, where could you could you see or foresee potential application? Uh, okay. So that, that's a, that's a very good okay. question. So um, I I actually imagine that these robots could be used almost everywhere. Actually, I think that right now people aren't thinking in that frame of mind that they would actually have something in their home that was uh, partially living, but. In, in the initial stages, I think the most likely usage of these is where we have a need for a, a disposable and environmentally friendly robot. So imagine we're trying to do a simple survey of the chemical ecology of the canopy in a rainforest. Uh, we might release a bunch of these climbing biodisposable robots 
and we release them into the canopy. They go do their job. They sense whatever they need to send, and then we just leave them. We don't worry about them anymore. Uh, another example would be uh, trying to, for example, find uh, mines in a minefield. So um, imagine that you've got a minefield and you don't know where things are. You have a huge canister of these robots, and they could be partly synthetic, partly biological. It doesn't really matter. They're all compressed into this canister. You fire it into the into the field. They crawl around. As soon as they find the the odor that corresponds to a mine, they stop and they beep and you look on your iPad and you've got now a map of where all of these mines are, but you don't have to go and retrieve them. They're disposable, they're not particularly dangerous to the environment, and uh, I think those sorts of applications are the immediate ones. Um, for the synthetic soft robots, um, I actually think that some of the first applications there will be in the biomedical realm. So uh, things like endoscopy, so looking inside the body, and also, in, of all places, space. Uh, I think that the need for small, light uh, robots that can be uh, used for surveying um, solar panels and um, antenna arrays is, is really quite pressing, that we have no way to actually go and check on or repair damage on these massive arrays. So small climbing, disposable robots would be a great uh, use there. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, do we have other questions to Professor Tremor? So maybe, maybe I can ask a question. So at the moment, you are working with cells from insects. Right? Yes. Is that right? Yes. And so I think you will not have problems with ethics committees. So when you're growing your muscles. For, so from when on do you think you will get in trouble with ethics committees when you that, use that, this kind of hybrid technology? That, that's actually a very important question. And it's, it's one that even came up when we were proposing our IGO program is, is do we have in place some sort of ethical training? and that, about about the types of things we're trying to do. Uh, I think it's very, very important. The, the big difference, I think, in my philosophy is that I'm not planning to put a nervous system into these devices. Uh, I know others would like to grow neurons as a, as, a, as a system, and there you're starting to build a brain. And my way of thinking is that it, we may as well use a microcontroller. It's almost certainly going to be faster uh, than any brain that we can make, and it's certainly more technologically achievable right now. And I think most people don't have a problem with, with moving meat, which is essentially what we have here, is moving meat. Um, and it's moving insect meat. Uh, it doesn't have a brain. The, the moment someone proposes to put a brain in these things, we are now creating new life forms that... I think there are serious ethical issues about um, and that we have to take major consideration. I think uh, it, it's a big advantage, as you already pointed out, using insects because there are fewer issues with, with, with dealing with the ethics of, of insect tissue. Uh, but I think from a technological point of view, it makes so much more sense. We've tried to do some of this work with, with rat cells, and, and there are others who have been very successful uh, building uh, little actuators from rat cells, but they're still not very tough. They don't work in the outside world. Um, we can leave our cells on the, on the bench top for a month without any, any influence whatsoever, and they're perfectly fine. Uh, and yet you couldn't do that even for a few hours with vertebrate cells. So I think that that helps us with the ethical issues because we're, we're dealing with insect cells. So I, I, I would put the threshold probably at the point where you give these devices the potential for sentience. Now, maybe you do that with a computer. I don't know. Right. Okay. Yeah, very good point. <laughs> okay, so do we have other, maybe one last uh, comment or question from the... You have one in Moscow or... Oh, well, that was just... Uh, okay. <laughs> right. Anyone else? Last question? Okay. If that's not the case, then I would like to thank again uh, um, Professor Trimmer for a very fascinating sort of 
a lecture with a link, definite link into the future. I can also mention that uh, next July we will have a summer school in Switzerland where uh, Professor Trimmer will also be one of the keynote speakers and uh, you might be interested in attending that event as well. So once again, thank, well, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you for getting up early and thank you all uh, for attending this uh, global virtual lecture hall.